man was born free, and everywhere he is in chains. Those who think themselves the masters of others are indeed greater slaves than they. With these few words, Jean-Jacques Rousseau begins the social contract and lays the foundation for his revolutionary political and social ideas that we're going to discuss this morning. So far in our series, we've discussed the work of Thomas Hobbes and John Locke and Montesquieu last week. Each of these thinkers contributed ideas that supported the move from theocratic absolutism towards constitutional monarchies that became the norm of 18th century Europe. Hobbes and Locke provided rational arguments uh, for the from the individual, while Montesquieu brought forward the notion of a general spirit and that society could be something that was greater than the sum of its parts. Today with Rousseau, we take a dramatic turn as his arguments laid the groundwork for the French Revolution, democracy, and even the autocratic communist regimes to come over a century later. But first, we'll cover some of the history and life of Rousseau to put him in context. Jean-Jacques Rousseau was born in the city-state of Geneva in 1712. In a story that becomes sort of common over his lifespan, he was orphaned and forced to flee when he was only 10 to Istanbul. I'm going to switch mics. He later relocated to France when he was 16. He, there he met Mrs. Warrens, who was 10 years older than him, and they had quite the alleged affair, uh, which was captured by many French artists. Their relationship was so close that it actually convinced Rousseau to abandon the Calvinism of his family and his parents in favor of Roman Catholicism. Must have been a love. He moved to Paris in 1742, but again he was forced to flee after only a year after he was fired from his position and he was facing outstanding arrest warrants. I'm not sure what he was in trouble for this time, but maybe someone can fill that in later. This time he fled to Venice. There he met where he later met Therese Levasseur in 1745, who he eventually married in 1768. Together they had five children, each of whom they abandoned to orphanages and who probably all died because... And the tragic irony here is that later in Rousseau's novel Emile, he lays the groundwork for our modern education system. You could almost say he comes from the do as I say, not as I do branch of philosophy. From 1762 to 67, he was in exile in England, this time on the invitation of David Hume, a philosopher likely known to many here as the founder of modern scientific skepticism. As is his way, Rousseau fell out with Hume and had to return to France, living under pseudonyms to avoid prosecution. He's a man on the run. He died in 1778, just a year before the French Revolution began, and during that revolution, many of his philosophies were actually taken to their extremes by men like Robespierre. Sorry about that. Those ideas of Rousseau were laid out primarily in the book here, The Social Contract, but also in Emile. And they try to answer the same questions that faced Hobbes, Locke, and Montesquieu that we've approached in our previous discussions. You know, what is human nature and how do we build a peaceful society? Hobbes saw human nature as described by a life that was nasty, brutish, and short. Rousseau instead argued that society corrupted the human spirit and that our, nature, that our natural state was good. Through his life, he moved away from Catholicism and more towards a deist position, just the idea that God created the universe and then sort of took his hands off. But he always believed that the creator God was intrinsically good. To Rousseau, this meant that anything in God's creation in the natural state must be good, therefore. So human natural state would be good. He sort of had the picture of a noble savage. It was only through jealousy and desire brought about through private property and the advent of society that created inequality and the power structures that would corrupt us. Rousseau went on and almost foreshadowed the mar arguments of Karl Marx, saying, quote, the first man who, having fenced in a piece of land, said, this is mine, and found people naive enough to believe him, that man was the true founder of civil society. From how many crimes, wars, and murders, from how many horrors and misfortune, might not anyone have saved mankind by pulling up the stakes or filling up the ditch and crying to his fellows, beware listening to this imposter. You are undone if you once forget that the fruits of earth belong to us all and earth itself to nobody. Rousseau turned his back somewhat on the other thinkers of the Enlightenment 
further arguing, arguing that advances in science and art also corrupted us, as they sought to fulfill our vanity and pride and provided extra time in which to indulge our senses, sen <coughs> For Rousseau, only those advancements that directly fulfill our primal needs can really maintain our natural sanctity. Rousseau also believed that the fear of death was not a natural phenomenon. Perhaps motivated by the idea of animals going off to die peacefully, Rousseau blamed priests and doctors and philosophers for constructing self-serving worldviews that made us irrationally fear our own mortality. He, he agreed with Hobbes that a fear of death would drive us, but to Rousseau, this drive was another corrupting force of society. In our book club discussion of mortality, we noted that Christopher Hitchens didn't seem to fear death as a process that many, and the death is a process that many seem to come to accept. Perhaps there's a physiological change in the brain that lets us sort of pacify us as we come to our death. But what we do fear is the idea expressed by Hitchens of the party going on and us being asked to leave. Oh, sorry for the mics today. Yeah. Through the social contract, Rousseau offers us an out to avoid the negative influence of society. Rousseau rejects the Hobbesian contract where individuals must submit their will and their freedoms to an absolute sovereign to prevent any violence. Instead, he argued for a positive social contract where you give up some natural freedoms in exchange for civil freedoms and protection, from, and protection of your property. This exchange provides a transition from the state of nature to civil society in the transfer of which people substitute their individual justice for a broader civic morality guided by what Rousseau called the general will. Like Montesquieu, Rousseau was a methodological collectivist, that is, one who believes that collective wisdom exists, which is greater than the sum of each person's self-interest. Rousseau called this the general will, and he argued it must supersede the individual for society to function. A greater good can then be accomplished by curbing the rights of some. The advantages here can be seen in things like our universal healthcare system, where everyone has to pay to make sure we have equitable coverage for the entire population. This idea led Rousseau to argue that society would have to have a form of diluted justice rather than absolute justice for everyone, since the right of the community would sometimes overrule the justice of the individual. To maintain order, this justice would be administered by the government, which for fairness, Rousseau argued should be elected and based on majority rule. Furthermore, government required the consent of the people and could not be based on hereditary or aristocratic titles, which was a big break from his peers at the time. For this scheme to work, though, the general will would have to be decided upon and generally known and agreed upon. If it was a mystery to everyone, you couldn't just follow along with it. Rousseau believed the general will could only be informed through vigorous and open debate among informed men. And we'll get back to Rousseau's views on women later. <laughs> this debate would help, the debate among the informed people would help weed out bad ideas, leaving the best ones. For this reason, Rousseau preferred a direct democracy at a manageable city-state level over a more large or representative national representative democracy. To advance the general will, Rousseau suggested that wise men would need to inspire a sense of national pride or citizenship among the public. These would be the philosophers or the meritocracy often serving executive roles in government. Taken too far, this idea gives us charismatic tyrants who dictate what is good for the country, even when it is not good for individual citizens. For citizens to contribute to the general will, people had to be educated in Rousseau's mind. For Rousseau, people were born as these noble savages, but through education be could become contributing citizens. He drew a sharp distinction between the citizen and the bourgeoisie, or aimless, as or what he viewed as aimless aristocrats who contributed nothing. As an exemplary citizen, Rousseau gives the example of the Spartan, who upon losing election for council is so proud that there are that many people more qualified than he to serve office. Don't think of our current crop of politicians. <laughs> Rousseau is arguably the first philosopher to denigrate the bourgeoisie again, paving the way for Karl Marx's class struggles nearly a century later. The point of education then for Rousseau was about getting people to value their community and to think for themselves. 
The first step in this process must then be negative education, as people need to unlearn what society has taught them. The education process is about highlighting each individual's strengths, as well as their weaknesses and limitations. The goal of education is to help people see what they can accomplish and to teach methodologies. Instead of indoctrinating students in what the truth is, or trying to instill concepts like duty or obligations, educators should guide students into how to discern better answers based on reason and evidence without rote memorization. Rousseau's approach laid the groundwork for critical and skeptical thought that we have guide modern humanism. This entire process for Rousseau would expand what he saw as sort of our innate self-interest to a broader compassion for others that would bring about model citizenship and stronger societies. Now turning back to Rousseau's views on women, he did argue for popular sovereignty and democratic rule, but he generally excluded women from having the vote. Most of his arguments came down to perceived physiological differences. Um, because our biology is different, men and women ought to have different tasks. These differences meant that men and women ought to be taught differently, and he observed that girls don't really like to learn to read and write, but man, do they pick up sewing fast. <laughs> At one point, <laughs> I know, I know there's lots of counterexamples. At one point, Rousseau argued that women were made to please men, and men would survive easier without women, but the same couldn't be true for women, who would be much worse off without men. In other passages, to his credit, Rousseau did argue that the differences between men and women were merely sexual. Rousseau argued that the differences between men and women were sexual, and in all other matters, the sexes could be considered equal. I don't think we can call him a proto-feminist, but he did live in 18th century France, well before movements for equal rights. And to his credit, he did argue against the Atlantic slave trade. Finally, with regards to religion, I already mentioned that Rousseau was raised a Calvinist, but con converted to Catholicism before out of lust before drifting to deism. In a meal, he advocated religious tolerance, a call that was condemned by both his Calvinist and Catholic upbringings. Seeing human nature as inherently good, he also rejected the concept of original sin. But perhaps the most important contribution on the topic of religion was his introduction of the idea of civic religion, which comes in the social contract in the last chapter. In there, he argues that religious and civic intolerance are two sides of the same coin, before Christianity, there was no separation between uh, religion and politics, so all wars could be considered religious or political. But with the Christian doctrine of the distinct kingdoms of heaven and earth, there was room made for the division between the sovereign and the church. In Rousseau's mind, this created a struggle for power over the hearts and minds of men. To solve this dilemma, he notes that the answer lied neither with the idea of purely rejecting religious influence from government, nor with having governments adopt Christian ethos. Rousseau rejects a secular government by noting that no state to that point had been founded without a religion, and that's his entire argument in the book. While Christianity was unsuitable as, quote, the Christian law is at bottom more injurious than serviceable to a robust constitution. He was no fan of Christianity by this point. He then explored the three kinds of religion he saw in society or in the world that he could identify before posing an alternative of civic religion to unite society. His three types were the religion of the individual, the religion of the citizen, and the religion of the priest. The religion of the individual was the true theism he saw in the Gospels, not the Christianity commonly practiced, but what he thought Christianity was supposed to be about. And in this case, it would be the one where you practice in the privacy of your own home with little concern for others. He thought this was untenable for society as it would divide people away from society or civic concerns, focusing instead on rewards or punishments in the afterlife instead of actually getting about with our lives. He says that, quote, a society of true Christians would not be a society of men. For Rousseau, Christians couldn't make a good society. Religion of the citizen, then, was a state religion, where worship was laid down by law. The value of this type of religion for Rousseau was that it united religion with patriotism. 
uh, for Rousseau, he noted that it, this, you know, this was valuable because Rousseau's big thing was bringing a stronger society. So having a state religion would bring people together to that society. But Rousseau noted that it would be a theocracy based on, quote, error and lies. It deceives men and makes them credulous and superstitious. You fit quite well at times with some of the more new atheist thinkers. And this was 1750. He also worries that a state religion can become tyrannical and intolerant. Finally, the religion of the priests was a split between the law of the land and the law of God, or church and state. And he exemplified this as the Catholic Church, which didn't always concern itself with the rule of governments at that time, but had its own realm. This third kind was irredeemable to Rousseau, who saw anything that divided society as worthless. He said, quote, it is so manifestly bad that the pleasure of demonstrating its badness would be a waste of time. That's how he dismisses Catholic Church. So instead of these three options, Rousseau argued for a generalized civic religion to unite society. The goal of this religion would be in promoting morality and citizenship in the people. The civic religion would have to have as few dogmas as necessary so that it could be as widely accepted. And these, for Rousseau, include quote, the existence of an omnipotent, intelligent, benevolent divinity that foresees and provides the life to come, the happiness of the just, the punishment of sinners, the sanctity of the social contract and the law, and no intolerance. So you had to believe in God, you had to believe in the afterlife, there had to be a heaven and a hell, religion had to bring people together, but it couldn't divide them. Rousseau argues that these core beliefs must be accepted by all citizens on the threat of banishment. Not, not for impiety, but for denying them would destroy society. So his core purpose of a civic religion was to unite society. He didn't really care if you couldn't believe in God. He wanted you to believe in God because it made you better to get along with. And you can't just fake it, he said, if you acknowledge these dogmas but live as if you don't believe in them, Rousseau said you should be put to death for lying before the law. So for Rousseau, atheism was a capital offense. On the whole, Rousseau introduces many fascinating ideas for us. For humanism, he does advance the notion of inherent, inherent dignity in each human and the ability of democratic discourse to arrive at collective wisdom. The social contract does provide a fantastic analogy metaphor for the exchange people make to live in a society. He also provides us a basis of an education system based on critical thinking rather than memorization. However, his emphasis on the sacredness of society over the individual should make us all a bit uncomfortable. His ideas can definitely be taken too far, and in some cases, Rousseau's arguments justify totalitarian regimes where the individual is erased by the will of the state. Further, his idea of a civic religion maintains the assumption that atheism is antithetical to a society and the pronunciation of it ought to be punishable by death. In contrast to the other philosophers we've covered, Rousseau provides a more optimistic view of human nature than Hobbes, a stronger society than Locke, and a more detailed vision than Montesquieu. His ideas are important even today, and given the knowledge of the intervening centuries, we can begin to identify, I think, where the limits should be placed between the general will 